Our Bible word is John 17 verses 20 to 21. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So this is Jesus in what is commonly known as the high priestly prayer. But Jesus is actually here more as the first intercessor, as the first helper or the first paraclete. Because if we go to John 14 verse 16, Jesus promises that he will send another helper, another paraclete. And the paraclete refers to an intercessory figure. He comes to your defense or your aid in a court of law, so to speak. He intercedes on your behalf. He argues your case. He defends you. And of course, he also attacks the opponents and discredits them. So Jesus is more yeah, the intercessor, more the, the first paraclete, the, the first helper in John. Although parallels have been drawn to Genesis 49, where Jacob gives, pronounces blessing and offers prayers for his sons. Also to Deuteronomy 32 verses 33, where Moses also pronounces prayers and blessings, etc. on the people. So it might be kind of Jesus' last testament, so to speak. There was also this other genre that existed at the time, and this writing known as the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, where the blessings are bestowed on their sons, etc. But the main thing of Jesus here is that he's the paraclete, the first paraclete, the first intercessor or helper, because he now prays to God on behalf of his disciples. Just before this, of course, we find Jesus' farewell discourse, and that is chapters 13 to 16. That is where Jesus addresses his disciples, and he tells them of things to expect and the troubles they will face, etc., in times to come, and the promise of the Holy Spirit or the paraclete that will come to help, to help them, etc. Now in verse 17, Jesus addresses God. So he no longer addresses the disciples, he addresses God. It's now a form of prayer. And there are three main parts to that prayer. In the first five verses, Jesus prays to be glorified. This is quite a main theme in the Gospel of John, that Jesus' crucifixion is his glorification. And it forms part and parcel of the same process that we will rise from the dead and ascend to the Father. So Jesus prays to be glorified. In other words, he prays to be crucified, to, to die, to resurrect from the dead and to ascend to his Father. The second section, that's from verses 6 to 19. That is where Jesus prays for his current disciples, those who are with him there in that wherever they gathered. And the prayer focuses on protection from the evil one in the world to which they have been sent. In other words, they've been sent out into the world to bear witness to Jesus. But of course, it's dominated by the evil one. And Jesus prays for protection. But although, like Jesus, they are not part of the world, so they are in the world and sent to the world, but they're not part of the world. Because the world in the Gospel of John represents everything that is in opposition to God and in opposition to Jesus. And the third part of chapter 17, or the prayer there, is where Jesus prays for future disciples. And that we find in verses 20 to 24. And this prayer focuses on an issue of vital importance in the evangelist's own day. That's the unity of believers so that the world may recognize Jesus' presence among them. We must understand at the time when the gospel was written, it was written for the Johannine community. That was a circle of Christians that gathered in Asia Minor, probably in Ephesus. And yeah, a John, probably John the Elder, wrote a gospel for them. And it would have consisted of Jews, of Gentiles and Samaritans, so they would have come from different backgrounds. And now this is a very, very important issue for, for, for the evangelist. That they must be one. They must be one people. If we again read our Bible word, 
I do not pray for these alone. In other words, that refers to the current disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And it also refers to John. John who, who wrote the gospel, who was this leader of, this, of these Christians there in Asia Minor. Because they will believe what he said about Jesus. That they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. They are in unity in Jesus. And Jesus is in the Father. But the Father is also in Jesus. And the Jesus is in the disciples. So there's this mutual indwelling. The disciples in Jesus and the Father. And the Father and Jesus in the disciples. Because Jesus and the Father gives the model of unity. Jesus is in the Father. The Father is sent him. He's the Son of God. That's the model of of oneness for the disciples also to emulate. And the reason it's given here is if they are one, the world will know this is where the Father is. This is where Jesus is, the one that is sent by the Father. That is what will make your witness authentic or true, that God is with you. God is present among you. And that will be shown to the world by your unity. And this unity is expressed by love. If we go to verse 24, he also prays here for, for Jesus, or for, for the people to, be, to come to where he is. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. And also verse 26, And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. So this unity between the disciples is a, is a bond of love. Like God has loved Jesus, like Jesus has loved his disciples, his followers, the similar love must be among his disciples. And this will give evidence for the world that this is where God is found. Because God is found where Jesus is present. Jesus, according to John's theology, Jesus is the new temple. In other words, this is where God is present in a special way. And where Jesus is present, that is where God is present. That's where His people come together. And of course, that now happens because the Holy Spirit is with Him and among them. This paraclete, this helper. So this is a special prayer. For future disciples. In other words, it speaks to John's own day. Probably the 90s AD when this gospel was written. It's a generation or two after the time of Jesus in the early church. Now a special prayer for them. That they must be one. And this union of believers from different ethnic backgrounds. Will be a testimony to, to the world. That God through Jesus is with them. And this is where God is truly to be found. This is where the new temple has been established in the world.